Today we'll review some of the fundamental concepts of algebra. These are in your pre-calculus book in the appendix section, so make sure you read and review those sections in your textbook. The first um, concept is interval notation. So let's look at the bounded intervals, which kind of says boundaries for uh, the inequality. So if we're looking at a to B, or all the values in between A and B, we use brackets only for including those values. And remember, we use closed circles to show that those values are included. If those values are not included, that's an open interval, and those are shown with parentheses, or on a, a number line with open circles. Now let's consider some combinations of those. So if we have an interval of A to, and A to B, which includes A, we're going to make sure that we write that inequality as a is less than or equal to x, which is less than b. Remember, b is not included. And on the number line, that would be a closed circle for a and an open circle for b and all the values in between. If we have a parenthesis a to b with a um, bracket, that's going to be a is less than x, which is less than or equal to b. Okay, because we were, we're going to make sure that we include B in there. So that's going to be an open circle for A and a closed circle for B and all the values in between. Okay, let's consider the unbounded intervals. So when we have um, values or inequalities that are going infinitely in one direction, so something like if we have um, X is greater than or equal to A, well then it's going all the way to the right or in the positive direction infinitely. And as an interval, it's going to include A, so that's a bracket for A, to positive infinity. We don't write the positive sign, but remember we close that with a parenthesis. If we're going to um, just have an open interval, and so it's just X is greater than A, um, that's going to be um, with a parenthesis. So that's not going to include A, and we could say X is greater than A, as an inequality, and on a number line has um, an open circle for A going to the right infinitely. Now let's look at a negative, or if we say a less than. So if we're saying um, we're going the negative direction or negative infinity, that means we're saying that X is going to be less than or equal to B. Because remember, look, if we look at the B, it has a bracket. Okay, so if it has a bracket, it's going to be less than or equal to. So on the number line, if we're going to graph that, that's a closed circle for B, and we're going to include all the values to the left or to, towards negative infinity. Now let's like look at the, the next one, which is very, very similar. So if we have um, X is uh, less than B, we can say that um, it's going to be an open circle for B, and it's going to be all the values to the left of B, so X is less than B. Whenever we have something that includes the entire number line, well, that's an interval notation that's negative infinity to infinity with parentheses on both sides. And we can also write that as all real numbers. So whenever we graph that, well, we just graph the whole number line. We just include all the values. So we could shade everything on the number line. You can include A and B um, that's already included whenever we shade that. Okay, let's look at some of the examples. We're going to rewrite the following inequalities in interval notation. So the first one we have X is greater than or equal to negative seven. So that means it's going to be an unbounded interval and go towards the positive direction. So when we write that, we're going to write that with brackets and it's going to be negative seven as our lower value to positive infinity. When we look at B, that's going to be a bounded interval between negative four and 10. It's going to include 10, but not include four, negative four. So we're gonna put a parenthesis um, in front of negative four and a bracket after 10. Letter C is X is less than two, which is, is an unbounded interval. So that's going to go towards the negative infinity. So we start that off with a parenthesis, negative infinity, and then it's gonna go up to two, but not including two. So we use a parenthesis. If we're going to describe X is not equal to four in interval notation, that means it's going to include all the values less than negative four. So that's negative infinity to four, but we put a parenthesis after four because it doesn't include it. And then it goes, includes all the values above four, so four to infinity. Now let's consider the domain of algebraic expressions. So the first one is a polynomial, 2x cubed plus 3x plus 4. There are no restrictions on that domain. Remember, that's going to be a cubic function. So that's going to have a set of all real numbers. So that's represented as negative infinity to positive infinity with parentheses. 
when we have a domain, when we look at a radical expression, we have to make sure the domain is restricted. Remember, you can only have positive numbers come out of the square root. So we know that x minus 2, that value, has to be greater than or equal to 0. And so when we solve it, that's just going to be x is greater than or equal to 2. And then if we're going to write that in interval notation, that's going to be a bracket 2 to positive infinity with a parenthesis. The next one has a rational expression, but remember we can never have a 0 in the denominator. So that means that that whole value, x minus 3, cannot equal 0. So that means x cannot equal 3. And if we're going to write that in interval notation, it's going to be all the values less than 3, so negative infinity to 3, not including 3, and all the values above 3. Let's consider um, the example. So we're going to describe the domain of each of these expressions using interval notation. So the first one has x squared minus 4 in the denominator. Remember, we can't have 0 in the denominator, so that whole expression can't equal 0. When we factor that, that's going to equal x plus 2. x minus 2 does not equal 0. So x cannot equal plus or minus 2. If we're going to express that in interval notation, that means that it, the values are, that are included are all the values less than negative 2, not including negative 2, all the values between negative 2 and 2, and then all the values that are greater than 2. Just make sure to include uh, parentheses because those values are not included. So it's including everything except for plus or minus 2. Now the next problem looks very similar. We have a square root symbol, so it's 1 over square root of x squared minus 4. So it looks very, we could do a lot of the same steps that we did in the previous problem. So x squared minus 4 is in the denominator, so that means it can't equal 0. But it's an absolute value, so it has to be greater than 0. So we're going to do a couple extra steps to make sure that we know which intervals this would work for. So we're still, we can still factor it to find the zeros, okay? So this, you know, just like a quadratic. So x can definitely, it, it can't equal plus or minus 2, just like the first problem, okay? So we look at these, and we actually can put them or plot them on a number line or a graph. We're considering that graph, and we're saying, okay, negative 2 and 2 are the zeros for that function. Well, we know that function is a quadratic. So if we graph that quadratic, it would be, um, open up, the zeros would be negative 2 and 2, and we're trying to see when is that value or that y value going to be positive. So um, when we look at the parabola, you can actually look at it graphically, and it's definitely going to include the intervals less than negative 2 and greater than 2. That's the only time the parabola is above that number line, or below if that was an x-axis. Okay, another way you can do it is just test some numbers. So we could pick numbers like maybe negative 3 because that's less than negative 2, or 0, because that's between, or maybe 5. And if we plug those values into the equation and evaluate them, get the y value, we can figure out when is it positive and negative. So negative 3 squared, that gives us 9 minus 4, which is positive. When you plug in 0, we get a negative 4, which is obviously a negative number. And then when you plug in 5, you get 25 minus 4, which is 21, and 21 is a positive number. That y value would be positive. So looking at that parabola, it's going to be above the x-axis. It's going to be positive in the intervals um, below negative 2 and above 2. So everything's going to be included just like we did in the last problem, except for that middle interval. Okay, that, those numbers are not going to work because it's going to make that square root negative. So we just write negative infinity to negative 2. Remember, we can't include negative 2. And then 2 to positive infinity. Okay, let's switch gears a little bit, and we're going to review properties of exponents and radicals. These are in the appendix section of your textbook again in 8.2. So remember, when we're combining or simplifying or changing, um, terms with exponents. They need to have the same base to combine the exponents. So a to the m times a to the n, you just add the exponents. So that's a to the m plus n. When you're dividing them, it's going to be um, a to the m minus n. Remember, we subtract the exponents when there's division. Whenever we have a to the negative n, well, a to the negative n will give us the reciprocal. So we could write that as 1 over a to the n. And we could also write that again as 1 over a raised to the n, because 1 to the n is just 1. 
So if we had something like this where we had a ratio raised to the negative n, well, if we wanted to make it a positive exponent, we could write b over a raised to the n. And we can also distribute that power, so it's b to the n over a to the n. Now remember, anything raised to the zero power is going to equal one. So a to the zero is going to equal one, but a cannot equal zero because zero to the zero is actually undefined. It means that you're dividing by zero. So let's look at the power rules. So a times b raised to the m, we essentially, that's like a power raised to the one. So we multiply those exponents because we're raising to a power. So that's going to be a to the m times b to the m. Then we have um, a to the m all raised to the n. Multiply those exponents and you get a to the m times n. Here we have a over b, a ratio raised to the m. We can do the same thing, raise each of those to the m power, so that's a to the m over b to the m. Whenever we have an absolute value, okay, we can still use the uh, powers uh, the properties of exponents. So square root of the absolute value of a squared is the same as the absolute value of a quantity squared. And any absolute value is going to be a positive value. That, so that'll equal a squared. Now let's change um, the exponential form into radicals. Remember, there is a conversion we can do. So anything, so a to the one over n can be expressed as the nth power of a. And so just like we have the square root of five, that's really a, with a two out there, that's the same as five to the one half. So just make sure you, you review how to change from radical form into exponential form. If we have something a little bit trickier, such as like a to the m over n, that's the same as the nth root of a to the m. And we can rewrite that as well as the nth root of a, all of that raised to the m. Quick review for scientific notation. Remember your first number has to be between one and 10. It can include 10. And then um, any of the powers of 10 are gonna be integers. So it could be a negative number, um, maybe like something like negative, uh, we'll say negative 500 or something. But it could be any integer um, for that power. Okay, let's look at the properties of radicals. So we can rewrite these as well. So you have the, we just did this one, but the nth root of um, a to the m. Okay, so we can rewrite that one and we wrote that right above, but that's gonna be the same as the nth root of a raised to the m. Now, when we combine um, nth root of a times the nth root of b, well, we can put those together. They have the same nth root, right? So that's gonna be the nth root of a times b. And same thing if we have a ratio, right? So if we have a ratio of nth root of a over nth root of b, they're essentially the nth root of a divided by b. Just make sure that this is saying we can't have b equal to zero. Now this one's a little bit trickier, but we have nth root of nth root of a. Okay, so when we actually um, find that we're dividing those or you know taking the radical, that's going to be the n times n root, root of a. So here we have um, the last pro, um, property of radicals, the nth root of a raised to the n. Whenever we have um, something like this, it's like a, if it's an even, okay, so like the square root of 5 squared. Well, that's just going to be the same as 5 to the 1 half squared, which is essentially going to cancel those two exponents, and you'll have 5 to the 1. All right, so that's just going to be a. But remember, we can only have positive numbers come out. So just make sure whenever you have an, um, an n root or a rat, you know, that, that value is even, you're gonna only take the absolute value or the positive value of a. Um, whenever you have something like, um, you know, something like that's cube root, maybe it's an odd number, that n is going to be an odd number. Well, you can have negative numbers come out of odd radicals. So that's just going to be a. All right, so let's simplify this radical expression. Um, it has two terms, so we're going to do one part at a time here. So we're doing cube roots. Okay, so a quick review of cube roots. We'll look at 81. 81 has 27 times 3 
or that's 3 to the 4th, which can be split up into 3 cubed times 3. And then, you know, it's a cube root, so we, we can make um, groups of 3 for the variable as well. So that's going to be x cubed, and left over is x squared. So we can see right away that that, cube, that 3 cubed and that x cubed are going to come out because it's a cube root. So when we simplify that, we're going to get 3x and then cube root of 3x squared. Okay, just to simplify that radical. All right, let's switch gears and look over at the second term. So if we look at this term, we'll, I'm going to look at these prime factorization, right? So we're going to split up 24. That's 8 times 3. 8 is a perfect cube, so that's 2 cubed. And then times 3, I'll just leave that in there. And then there's no, um, not enough x's to come out, so I'm just going to leave x squared. So the 2 is going to come out, so we'll have minus 2. And then um, inside the radical, we'll still have cube root of 3x squared. All right. So if you look at both of these terms, you could notice that they have the same, they have a common term. We can factor that common term out. So 3 cube root of 3x squared is going to factor out. All right, we could take it out of each of those terms. So make sure we write that in the front. So 3, or cube root of 3x squared. And then what's left over is just going to be 3x minus two. Well, we could rewrite, you know, we do, we can use the commutative property too. So we do, we can write it a different way. You can write three X minus two times the cube root of three X squared. Okay. So we can combine those terms, use the commutative property, but essentially both of those answers are correct. All right. So whenever we, um, the last part is looking at rational ex expressions. So what we need to make sure we know how to do is to factor. So we're going to uh, look at rational expressions and we're going to do some operations. So the first one is just to simplify. And whenever we simplify, we always try to factor as much as possible. All right, so factor each of those polynomials in the numerator and the denominator and see if something can cancel. Okay, so let's look at the example four. So 12 plus x minus x squared. Factors of 12 are four and three. Um, 4x minus 3x would give us x. Okay, so we can um, we know we can factor that um, into four, uh, what's that, minus x, and then three plus x. Okay, so um, that's gonna be the numerator. And then on the denominator, we can factor that. So if we look at two and four, um, you guys could use the box method. If you use the box method, uh, just have to play around a little bit more because you have a coefficient in front of x squared. So that's going to be two times four, which is eight. Factors of eight that add up to negative nine would be negative one and negative eight. And so we can use our um, decomposition if we want to. So that would be you know two x squared minus x and then minus eight x plus four. So that's gonna factor into two x minus one, x minus four. You can kind of see um, the top and the bottom look very similar. Okay, so if I rewrote that numerator four minus x, if I, re I could rewrite as negative one times x minus four. So those would essentially cancel and still have that negative one on the top. Um, but that's all that cancels. So if I want to simplify that or just write it out, it would be negative. Um, 3 plus x is left on the top and then 2x minus 1. You could also write x plus 3 on the top as well. Just remember, whenever we're looking at the rational expressions, we do need to go back to what we just talked about with the domain. And there are restrictions with this domain. Looking at the factored form, we know that x can't equal uh, 1 half. Right? And then remember we canceled out the x minus four, so we need to make sure we include that as well, that x cannot equal four. Okay, so that's probably the biggest hiccup if people forget um, the canceled out uh, binomial or uh, factor that can't equal zero as well. Okay, so don't, just don't forget that you do have restrictions on the domain. Um, I would definitely re recommend that you review how to factor. So just a quick little review. Um, difference of squares, x squared minus 64 is x plus 8, x minus 8. Um, that's an easy one for you guys. Whenever we have something, um, a polynomial, we always want to find the GCF so we can factor out the x first. And then that's going to be x plus 8, x minus 8. 
Um, if we have x cubed minus 64, remember that's a difference of cubes, <clears throat> and that's going to factor into x minus 4, x squared, uh, plus 4x, plus 16. So just make sure that you review how to factor um, difference of squares, any sorts of um, polynomials, and um, difference of cubes there. So just a, a review, a quick review uh, for the um, factoring cubes. Okay, so if we have um, a cubed plus b cubed, remember that factors into a plus b, and then um, a squared minus a b plus b squared. And then just like we did above, if we have a difference, so that's a cubed minus b cubed, that's going to factor into a minus b, a squared plus a b plus b squared. Okay, let's consider um, how to perform operations with rational expressions. So just remember, whenever you have uh, multiple terms, you always have to find the least common denominator. So that's pretty easy, but we always, whenever we're adding or subtracting fractions, always find the LCD. Okay, so for this example, we're going to look at um, these three terms. And if we look at the denominators, well, you have x minus 1, x, and x squared minus 1, which is really x plus 1, x minus 1, right? We, don't, we definitely can see that um, we're going to have a common factor in there. So the LCD will just be, um, the, you know, we have it, you need an x, and then we need an x minus 1, and then x plus 1. You don't need to include x minus 1 twice, because that may, would not make the least common denominator. So, um, and if you did, it wouldn't be wrong later on. You just have to simplify, which um, tends to be tougher, at, you know, after you multiply everything. So for each term, we're going to uh, multiply the numerator and the denominator by whatever is missing from the LCD. So 3 over x minus 1, well, we need to multiply the top and bottom by x times x plus 1. Um, so we can have that common denominator. For 2 over x, we'll need to multiply both the top and the bottom by x squared minus 1, or x plus 1, x minus 1. So I'll just multiply the top and bottom by x squared minus 1. And then for the last term, we really are just missing an x. So we need to just multiply the top and the bottom by x. Okay, so we have actually used the LCD and multiplied each of the terms by whatever was missing um, from the denominator. So uh, it's really helpful to write the LCD and kind of confirm and just look at each term separately. And then now we're just going to combine all those um, terms. So we use distribution first, you know, make sure that we combine everything on the numerator. But the den denominator will just be equal to x times x plus 1, x minus 1. Okay, so let's look, let's start with the first term. So when we have um, the 3 times um, distribute that, we get 3x squared plus 3x. All right, so that's good for the top. And then if we look at the second term, well, we're going to distribute the negative sign. So we get negative 2x squared plus 2. All right, so we put that. And then let's look at the third term. So we're just multiplying everything by x, so that'll just be x squared plus 3x. And remember, the denominator will just be equal to x times x plus 1, x minus 1. All right, let's combine all like terms in here. So we get um, 3x squared minus 2x squared plus x squared. That's going to be 2x squared. And then we have the 3x and the 3x, so that'll be plus 6x and then plus 2 at the end. I'm just going to write the denominator here. I don't uh, multiply it because there might be something that factors, but looking at the numerator, probably not. So um, we do have a GCF in the top, so a 2 will factor out. So we get 2 times x squared plus 3x plus 1. That trinomial is prime. So our final answer will just be 2 times x squared plus 3x plus 1 over x times x plus 1 times x minus 1. Okay, so whenever we want to rationalize uh, denominators and numerators, we're, we're going to need to consider the uh, values in complex form. So if we have a minus b times the square root of n, 
m and then a plus b times the square root of m and we're trying to rationalize those numerator and denominators we need to we need to make sure we multiply by the conjugates so a minus b times the square root of m and a plus b times the square root of m are conjugates of each other so when we look at the to rationalize them we can also consider if something is just a square root of m um, we just need to multiply you know the numerator and the denominator by square root of m for a cube root we need to make sure that we rationalize it so that we have a perfect cube so for this first example we're in it we're going to look at um, these fractions and rationalize the denominator so we have square root of seven in the denominator so need, that means we're going to need to multiply the top and the bottom by square root of seven so we just distribute so on the top we'll get um, four times the square root of seven and then on the bottom we're going to make sure we just you know multiply this so we get three times the square root of seven which is seven so that's 21. for b we're going to multiply the top and the bottom by cube root of 25 or five squared to make sure that we have enough uh, terms inside the radical to come out. We, we need three fives. So the top will just be simplified will be cube root of, I'm um, sorry, three times the cube root of 25. And then on the bottom, we'll just get five because we have five cubed now and the cube root of five is just going to be, or five cubed will be five. All right, so just make sure we know how to simplify those or rationalize them. For C, we're going to rationalize the denominator. Again, we have a complex number, 9 plus root 3. The conjugate will be 9 minus root 3. So we multiply the top and the bottom by 9 minus root 3. We're going to distribute, well, let me just multiply them. So we get 2 times uh, 9 minus root 3 on the top. And then for the bottom, you just need to make sure that you FOIL. So we get 9 plus root 3 times 9 minus root 3. Kind of see this will be a difference of squares but when you foil you get 81 plus 9 root 3 minus 9 root 3 and then minus root 3 times root 3 will just be 3. so those middle terms will cancel out so you could um, cancel those out and on the bottom we'll get um, 81 minus 3 so this will be uh, 2 times um, 9 minus root 3 on the top and then on the bottom we'll get 81 minus 3 which equals 78. Now we can reduce this a little bit more right so um, 2 goes into 78 so we can reduce that so that's going to be uh, let's see let's write this so 9 root 3 on the top and then over 39. All right, there may be some instances and we're gonna show you, um, I'll show you another example, but to rationalize the numerator. It's the same concept though. You'll have to multiply the top and the bottom by a conjugate. So the conjugate of square root of five minus three is just the square root of five plus the square root of three. So we're gonna multiply the top and the bottom by the same thing. Make sure it stays the same, right? It's an expression. So on the top, we're going to have to do some foiling. Again, we'll get that difference of squares. But we'll get square root of 5 times square root of 5, which is 5. And then we'll get square root of 15 minus square root of 15 minus 3. Okay, because you get square root of 3 times square root of 3. And then on the bottom, we'll just get 4 times the square root of 5 plus the square root of 3. All right, so you can notice that those middle terms are going to cancel out. So on the numerator, we'll get 2, and in the uh, denominator, we'll get 4 times the square root of 5. Um, let me just write that again. Uh, 4 times the square root of 5 plus square root of 3. And you can see again that there's going to be some reducing. So 2 goes into 4 two times. So our final answer will just be 1 over uh, that's going to be 2 times the square root of 5 plus square root of 3. So we could write that as 1 over 2 root 5 uh, plus 2 root 3. Okay, the key time we're going to have to rationalize the numerator is when we use the difference quotient. And we're going to go over the difference quotient more 
this year as you prepare for calculus. So if you look at the, uh, the expression here, we have square root of x plus h minus the square root of x. So we're going to rationalize that numerator. So we're going to multiply the top and the bottom by its conjugate, which is going to be the square root of x plus h plus the square root of x. So we need to make sure we multiply the top and the bottom by the same term. Remember, we're rationalizing just for practice. Um, this will be the time when we will have to rationalize them with the difference quotient. All right, so in the numerator, I'm going to distribute that. So we get, again, a difference of squares. Remember, so it's going to be x plus h. And then it's a little bit confusing, but when we um, FOIL, we're going to get uh, minus the square root of x times x plus h. And then we'll get plus the square root of x times um, x plus h. Remember, those two middle terms are going to cancel. And then we get uh, minus the square root of x times the square root of x, which is just minus x. And in the denominator, we'll have h times the square root of x plus h minus, oh, sorry, plus square root of x. All right, so let's just simplify the top. So remember, those middle two terms are going to cancel. And then if we look at the x plus h minus x, the x's are going to also cancel. So we'll just be left with h on the top. And then the numerator will still, or the denominator will still have h times the square root of x plus h plus the square root of x. Okay, those h's will cancel out. And what we'll have left is 1 over x plus um, h plus the square root of 